Mark Keening, the cross commodity research strategist at SOCGEN, joins us from Singapore today. Good morning to you, Mark. Thanks for joining us on the joining us on the program. You know, as far as Syria and you know oil, I mean the the uh, linkage or the relationship is a little bit dicey. But I guess it's more about mood and psychology, isn't it? Uh, especially at a time when uh, production output out of the Sudan and out of Libya has been uh, curtailed, so people can understand why any altercation in the Middle East might be disruptive, to say the least. Very much so. Uh, good morning, Bernie. Yes. Um, firstly, the oil markets currently are, are very tight in terms of the, uh, the physical supply at the moment. We've had about 2.7 million barrels a day coming off the market uh, due to various disruptions around the world and principally the largest component of that has been in Libya where last month alone we've had about a million barrels a day coming out off the production due to the unrest and the strikes in the export terminals. So the market is, uh, is, is positioned very tightly. Normally at this time of the year we would see seasonal weakness due to a, mm -hmm. due to a slowdown in refinery runs, but that has been more than offset by these global disruptions. Now the Syrian situation, is, as you point out, Syria is, uh, is, is really not uh, on the world map at the moment as a producer of oil. Its, its, its daily production is down to around 50,000 barrels a day. Uh, at its height two years ago, before the beginning of the unrest, we were around 350,000 barrels. So the risk really uh, with anything that, that might happen in Syria is, is really a function of how much this spreads within the region. And the area that we are most concerned about, and this is really just an example, is what might happen if it, uh, if it spreads uh, further into Iraq. Now there's two components in Iraq. There's the, the, the northern pipeline taking the Kirkuk oil uh, out to the, uh, the, the Turkish port, the Cheyenne port. Now that pipeline has already been hit a significant amount of times over the last three months, and we've had throughput through that down about 200,000 barrels a day. If we do get a strike in, 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 in Syria, then we can expect uh, uh, ongoing, ongoing tensions with that pipeline. And that should probably push oil up to around 120, 125. But the key thing... Okay, Mark, let me interrupt you for just a second there. Uh, don't we need to take an account... We're talking about current, just-in-time uh, production variables here. But don't we need to look at uh, inventories and what's been happening? Uh, over the uh, over the summer months, I, I, last time I looked at and checked the API. I mean, just to use the American example, they're very very well stocked. You know, uh, very well stocked with inventories. Add to that the spur, and you're in pretty good shape. I mean, you know, a week, two, three limited uh, military surgical strikes by the U.S. and Syria. They're not going to make a drop of difference, are they? They will to the price of Brent. Uh, as you correctly point out, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. WTI grid is 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 well supplied. Although we have had significant draws in the inventory in the, in the very sensitive Pad 2 Cushing region, which is the pricing point of WTI, and largely these draws have been a function of the increased infrastructure and moving crew down to the refining hubs. So when we, when we, when we, when we analyze the geopolitical component of the oil market, uh, it's, it's, it's with Brent uh, that, that we look at it predominantly. WTI is very sensitive to its own local supply and demand dynamics at the moment, and these are, and these are developing, uh, these are developing in the ever ever changing context with the production of shale and the growth in, in transport infrastructure. So with price spikes and, and the risk, it's really with Brent that we're concerned about. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, we, okay, I mean, I, who, we, don't, we don't know what's going to happen, um, assuming that some sort of limited uh, military intervention takes place, but um, Iran has already taken the ball and run with it and said this gives them an opening and they would see this as a vindication for them to act against Israel. If we get to that scenario, if this comes to pass, what happens then? I mean, all hell breaks loose in the Middle East, what happens to oil prices? Then your 120, 125 scenario is already wiped out, isn't it? And we head basically into uncharted territory. We do. Uh, the key risk, the most, the most obvious example is uh, the Basra export terminal in Iraq is uh, Shiite controlled. It's controlled by the Iraqi government. Uh, it's very close to Iran. Uh, the most obvious weapon that Iran really has against the West to retaliate to a certain extent against the sanctions and so on and so forth would be to increase tensions in some capacity at that export terminal. Now that terminal is moving around two million barrels a day of Iraqi crude out. 
and we calculate the uh, disruption there uh, of the order of magnitude of around half a million barrels a day would be sufficient to cause a significant price spike. And the price spike that, uh, that we've looked at is up to $150 a barrel in Brent. That would be extremely short-lived, and I stress that that is just a, a scenario, and it's an example of a possible point of supply disruption. If we were to get a spike like that, of course, Saudi would uh, likely issue a press statement pretty, pretty uh, immediately, uh, saying that they could make up any shortfalls. They have around 1.7 to 2 million, dollars, uh, 2 million barrels of spare capacity. And likewise, you would also get a, a release probably from the IEA, uh, uh, referencing an SPR release of some description. So it would be a spike, but that would be an example of one area where uh, Iran, if they wanted to, to get involved, could disrupt oil prices. Okay. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's kind of no man's land. Who knows where we're going with this story, but uh, we do have to keep on top of it.